So thank you very much. I appreciate everybody coming out on such a sunny day. I wish I had a brighter, happier topic to talk about today, um, but we are where we are for that. Um, I am a genuine you know, policy wonk. I love talking, thinking, you know, debating, discussing um, issues in and around the Middle East. Um, so please feel free to you know, jot down my email. I gave you my civilian one just because my, my military official one is just uh, really a little bit too cumbersome. So feel free you know, to send me questions, thoughts, observations, or whatever, um, and I'd be more than happy to talk about it. So um, what I thought I'd do is try and take you know, the uh, reading you had, which was kind of on Middle East disorder, and there's plenty of that, and I'll talk a little bit you know, about that and provide, I think, some of the regional context. Um, but I want to really, as much as I can, zero that down to kind of the problems, challenges, and opportunities it presents for US policy and strategy in the region. Um, there are a number of global and regional factors that I think are really limiting our options in the region. Um, I think at the same time the region is undergoing this upheaval. Uh, it's a really important time to just recalibrate what our U.S. national security interests are in the region, because I think those are changing. I mean, you know, there's the old Lord Palmerston adage that we have no permanent enemies, no permanent allies, only permanent interests, and it's our duty to pursue those interests. Well, I think our interests are actually changing, in particular in the Middle East. And so we'll talk, I want to talk a little bit about that. And then again, I want to really bear down on kind of what all this means for U.S. strategy. Um, we're kind of built to talk about 50, 60 minutes, and then we'll take a break and do Q&A. Um, we'll see how time goes. But if, uh, if we need to, you know, and questions come up, if I can't get to those specific issues like Iran, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, uh, we'll have more than enough time during Q&A to dig down in those. I, mean, I think this is one of the misconceptions, I think, that's really important to uh, just get off the table. Um, a lot of commentary and pundits that you'll read about really blame what's going on in the Middle East on a U.S. withdrawal or departure um, from the region. And so they really attribute that, the chaos to the U.S. disengagement. And, and if you believe this, the solution to that's pretty obvious, right? It's we're not doing enough, we need to do more. We need more determined leadership. We need more resolved leadership. We need more, more U.S. engagement, not less in the region. Um, I don't buy this. Um, and, and so I think this is just kind of a, a recipe for strategic disaster if we don't get past this. There's a lot more in terms of the local, regional, and global dynamics that we need to think through. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, you'll see I do use a, a fair number of slides uh, for, the, for the most part, that's for me. Because in the policy world, if you had asked me to do this talk, I would be done in 10 or 15 minutes. But for better or worse, I've been in the academic world for about 15 years now. So now the same challenge is you need to give me a minimum of three hours, and that'll just be less than one of a semester long course. So I kind of use these to keep me on track. It gives you something else to look at um, as we go through the lecture. And you know maybe it'll spark some thoughts. Um, the, the big thing, I think, in terms of the world, you take a look, and it's no longer that unipolar moment that you know, scholars thought after the Cold War where the US just emerged as the leading global superpower. Um, you know, what exactly this new environment is, whether it's a multilateralism, whether it's what Richard Haas called a nonpolar world, or whether we're in a world where just regional actors are gonna start to dominate their regions. And you take a look at Russia in, uh, in Eastern Europe, you take a look at China, in Asia, and you can make a case for that's what's going on. But the bottom line is, I think there's been a diffusion of power. I mean, certainly from the United States to other state actors in the region, but also away from state actors in general, to where you're empowering individuals, non-state actors, terrorist groups on the bad side, where that didn't used to be a problem confronting US strategy makers, it is today. So the, that's going to make it's going to make it you know more problematic for the U.S. to really exert decisive influence across the globe. Um, I think that's particularly true um, in the region, but both certainly the United States, but also actors in the region have been doing their own pivot to Asia. 
And if you're a, a policy wonk, you can read uh, then Secretary Clinton's article in Foreign Policy in 2011. And she makes a great case for why the US needs to pivot away from the Middle East, where we've been heavily engaged for decades, and really look toward Asia, because that's where the future is. That's uh, where you know, global population is. It's where expanding uh, energy markets are. And it's where the, really the center of gravity for the global economy is shifting eastward with the emerging markets in Asia, China, India, uh, Korea, Japan, et cetera. So that's kind of taken everybody's attention away from the Middle East. And Middle East regional leaders are looking at that too. And so really what this amounts to is the real foundation for the US engagement in the region, which has been essentially the US will provide security for the region in exchange for the free flow of oil. And that basic agreement, the foundation for our whole strategic rationale for being so heavily engaged in the region is under a lot of pressure. And that foundation is cracking. Um, the regional players themselves, their major energy markets and exports no longer come to the United States. I mean, two thirds of the Arab Gulf Cooperation Council states, two thirds of their economies are now tied to Asia. So not only are we looking to Asia, but the Arab partners and countries themselves are looking to Asia. So that's kind of, these are kind of the tectonic plates at the global level that I think are moving the US and uh, Arab uh, countries away. And you see this reflected you know, in, in at least two different presidents in different ways, right? This was a quote from President Obama's discussion with Jeffrey Goldberg at the Atlantic. And he just said at the end of his term, he goes, frankly, US interests are just less engaged in the region. The Middle East is just simply less important to the United States. And you see that, that same sentiment, I think, reflected in, the, in a different way, but from President Trump's perspective, it's a business transactional deal, right? So no longer do we have this just moral wholesale commitment to the region. It's, well, if you can pay for the security, you know, we'd be happy to help out. But if we don't have that bargain, that business transaction, we're not interested anymore. So at the same time, all these pressures are going on. I mean, the US military engagement in the region has really changed. And I think it's worth just taking a look at this chart, kind of gives you a sense. So this is US troops in the region, starting from 1950. And you can see very, very little troop engagement for decades and decades for the United States. And of course, we had a temporary boost with Desert Shield, Desert Storm after Iraq invaded Kuwait in 89 and, and we launched our operations in early 1990. And then the biggest boost, of course, you see is after 9-11 with the US engagements in Iraq or Afghanistan. So this perception of a US draw, withdrawal or disengagement from the region is real, but I'd argue it's also inevitable, right? I mean, so really what we're doing with a US military drawdown is we're kind of returning to what was a historic norm. But folks in the region perceive this as a disengagement and again kind of putting that security in exchange for oil deal under pressure. So the big question is, you know, what is our proper role uh, going forward? And I'm hoping in question and answer session you have all the answers for that because I certainly don't. Um, but as we think about this, you know, it's kind of useful to approach this with a little bit of humility. Uh, Philip Gordon was someone who served on uh, Obama's National Security Council, and he wrote uh, this article here. And it just reminds you that particularly in terms of the application of US military power in the region, we've kind of tried every available option, and it really, none of them have worked out, right? So in you know, Iraq, he says, look, we intervened, we occupied for over a decade, and what's the result been? Civil war, rise of terrorism, chaos, you know, phenomenal reconstruction bills. Um, in Libya, we kind of tried the opposite. It's like we intervened a little bit, really supported our NATO allies, uh, contributed air, missiles, um, logistics, intelligence, et cetera. But we really, we didn't occupy, we really didn't do much else. And what was the result there? Kind of similar civil war and disaster. Um, and then you take a look at Syria. We did neither, right? We really didn't intervene. We didn't occupy. And the result is civil war. Um, you could add Yemen to this list, 
right, where we kind of, we just followed and supported key Gulf Arab allies, in particular Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, provided them with logistics, ammunition, uh, targeting assistance, and what's the result there? What the UN calls the worst humanitarian disaster in the world today. So kind of, it's just useful to keep in mind and approach, uh, approach this with a little bit of humility as we debate how to move forward. Um, these are kind of, that's at the kind of the global level. I think at the regional level, each of these major developments uh, really illustrates the fact that, look, if, if these are the prime drivers, and I argue they are the prime drivers of developments in the region right now today, um, the U.S. is going to have very little to say about how these issues are settled. Um, the biggest one, of course, was the Arab uprisings, and this is what I term this weakening of existing authority. And you can see the Arab uprising started in 2011. They, in very rapid succession, ousted major longtime U.S. allies in the region, President Ben Ali from Tunisia, President Mubarak in um, Egypt, and then subsequently President Ali Abdullah Saleh from Yemen. And they were gone in practically the blink of an eye. And of course now with Syria was a different story. President Assad there looked at what happened elsewhere in the region, and he said, I'm not going to let these uprisings get out of control or out of hand. I'm coming down, I'm coming down hard. And of course, that just sparked pure civil war. But he's in a position now, and we can talk about this in a little bit more detail later, but he's in a position now where he's kind of effectively restored most of his control um, over what, uh, what has been, you know, Syria. So that's just phenomenal. And, and there have been a couple big impacts from the Arab uprisings. One of them has been the kind of the traditional centers of power in the region have really been weakened. I mean, the Arab uprisings, even though they've touched kind of just virtually every country in the region, they really hit the, uh, the secular nationalist countries hard. I mean, the republics, it was, so Egypt, Yemen, uh, Libya, Tunisia, Syria, those that kind of grounded their identity in secular nationalism really suffered the most. And, and the Arab Gulf countries, and the monarchies actually came off relatively, you know, less scathed. In part, that's because of the religious legitimacy a lot of the monarchies draw on. Saudi Arabia leader, of course, is a custodian of the two holy mosques. Um, both the King Abdullah in Jordan and the King in Morocco uh, draw some legitimacy from claims to be direct descendants from the prophet. Um, and of course, you also have the uh, Arab Gulf countries have the advantage of oil money. And so they can kind of spread the wealth a little bit and keep discontent uh, down to a bare minimum. So that, that means traditional centers of power um, in the region have kind of moved eastward too. And it's really empowered the Gulf state actors, in particular Saudi Arabia and the UAE, to take independent action. Um, there is a battle for identity going on in the Middle East. And Shibli Telhami uh, here is a professor in Maryland who, who wrote a brilliant book, The World Through Arab Eyes, if you're interested in understanding the Arab perspective. And again, I think if, if you buy my argument that power is kind of diffusing from the center, then understanding what the people actually think really makes a difference. And these Arab uprisings, one of the unique features of them was they weren't, they weren't anti-American, right? You didn't see American flags being burned in Tahrir Square in Cairo. I mean, there's a protest against their own Arab leaders saying, look, you've not deliver, delivered on your promises for economic prosperity or for political liberalism or tolerance, and we're ousting you. So, so they're inward focused. And the question is what comes after, right? So you have this battle, you have the longest trajectory, the longest kind of institutional momentum goes to the Islamist, right, in terms of identity. And roughly, you see, according to Telhami and his survey, it's kind of a roughly one-third, one-third split. One-third primarily identify themselves as Muslim. They're part of an Islamic community. The Ummah worldwide goes across borders. Um, you know, borders in terms of nation states really don't have that much. Um, meaning, in this view, if you attach your primary source of identity to being a Muslim, um, and this is kind of the, the theology that the Islamic radical groups are, are feeding off of, right? 
Um, you st still have a sense of being Arab. I mean, one of the things that shocked most observers of the region was how quickly the Arab uprising spread from one country to the other. And I mean, that's in part because there's a shared language. So the media can kind of translate what's happening in Cairo, and people can feed off that in Yemen, Damascus, and elsewhere. Um, some of it's a shared history. A lot of it's shared social problems, and I'll talk about that um, in a little bit. But it still means something to be Arab. And then the other third is kind of the secular nationalist. You know, it still does mean something, maybe less so, to be Egyptian, to be Lebanese, to be Emirati. But that sense of identity is actually relatively thin. I mean, most of these states were formed post-World War I, post-World War II. The Gulf states never really achieved their independence until 1970s, right? So this sense of being Emirati or being Lebanese is thin. It's there, but historically it's relatively thin. And of course, democracy is the latest newcomer there. But frankly, a lot of, a lot of Arabs, you can read this in the press if you talk to Arabs, you know, they took, a look, they took a look at Iraq and go, eh, I'm not sure we want to buy off on this democracy stuff, you know, when they take a look at what happened in Iraq. So democracy is kind of a, a weak, thin read um, in terms of the future of the region. So, and, and maybe we can and should do more, but it's worth keeping that in mind um, in terms of the scale or, or uh, a steepness of the slope decline. So all that's really resulted in a tremendous... Um, empowerment to Islamic radicalist groups who, uh, who undermine and seek to undermine existing authorities. And so you have a rise of the failed states. And the U.S. is really just kind of overwhelmed in terms of, you know, trying to deal with this. So uh, sectarianism is not new to the region. Um, there's always been kind of this theological divide between Sunni and Shia Islam. Shia Islam is clearly the minority in the region, about 10% of the region. 90% um, of the region are, are Sunni and they're Arab. But for, for the most part, I mean, for centuries, actually, there was no open Sunni-Shia conflict, right? I mean, you had a theological divide, but folks actually got along. And a lot of cities in the region, particularly like Damascus, um, Tehran, Baghdad, they were actually really multi-communal. Um, Right? And you had a lot of cross marriages between Sunni, Shia families. Um, so there really wasn't this divide. It, it, this divide actually got a lot of attention and a lot of traction after the 1979 revolution in Iran because Khomeini came to power um, after a couple of years, actually established himself as kind of the, the head of the theocratic government in Islam in, in Iran. And he promoted, he said, we're going to export Shia Islam across the region. So that, that really sparked a lot of the sectarianism. And really, the US invasion of Iraq, where we ousted Saddam Hussein, who was a secular Arab leader, and a lot of folks in the region viewed him as a bulwark against Iranian expansion. We took him out of power that in a country where the Shia are the clear majority, it was certain you know, that their, their relative power um, was going to rise in Iraq. And so that just really increased the anxiety in the Sunni Arab world in particular. And then last, you have this information age and technology um, that's really, I mean, it's neither good nor bad. I mean, on the good side, I mean, a lot of this technology really enabled a lot of the uprisings, right? I mean, folks could actually communicate on Facebook um, and other means, Twitter and other social means, and they could kind of avoid the security blockades. They could coordinate the time and location of their protest. And they knew what they did want. They did not want the current leadership, right? But of course, what they, what they haven't really gotten over is that additional hurdle of, okay, this is what we don't want, but what is it we want to replace it with? And that's where kind of this identity crisis, you know, feeds in. To itself. And of course, terrorist groups have exploited, you know, the technology for recruitment. They don't have to recruit locally. They can recruit globally. They don't have to recruit just in the region. They can recruit, and they do recruit, and successfully so, uh, to disenfranchised, um, culturally alienated populations across the world. So that's obviously a downside to the technology thing. Um, the other important thing to really think about, I think, is recognizing the scale of the socioeconomic problems that exist 
in the Middle East. And this is something that's widely shared across the region. It's obviously each country's, you know, particularly the division between the oil exporting states and states who don't have oil, there's relative difference. But for the most part, all these issues are pretty well shared and is one of the reasons the Arab uprisings just spread throughout the region because they all have these common grievances in common. Uh, unemployment in the region is twice that of what it is in the world. And if you add uh, unemployment among the youth, it's upwards of like 60% in places, 40 to 60% of the youth are unemployed. And that's a problem, uh, particularly when you have men who can't afford, in a conservative culture, they can't afford to get married, they can't afford to pay a dowry, they don't have a job where they can raise a family, and you have Young men who don't have a job, can't get married, they're, they're frustrated in a number of ways, that's not a recipe for stability, right? So you add all these things together, and I think regardless of what you end up with for governments in the Middle East, they're going to be facing these problems. And the scale of these problems are just huge. And guess what? The U.S. isn't going to rescue anybody from these problems. There's no, I think there's no appetite in the United States to do a massive, you know, Marshall Plan for the Middle East when we're struggling, you know, in many local communities uh, as we are. So, I mean, that's a problem that's going to be unresolved, I think, sadly, uh, for decades. So, again, getting back to kind of this internal debate, I think there are kind of two major sides of the coin um, in terms of, well, what accounts if you're Arab and you're looking both inward and outward, you're saying, look, we're, we were really once the pinnacle of world culture, right? We contributed just massive amounts to literature, to um, uh, philosophy, to mathematics. I mean, after all, we use the Arabic numeral system, right? And then, but today we're, we're facing all these problems. What explains our decline and the decay in our society? Well, on the one hand, you have the radical Islamic groups tapping into this sense, it's because we've turned away from God, right? And this isn't only happening in the Middle East. I mean, you take a look at the debates here in the United States, right? I mean, if you have Jerry Falwell and others, I mean, what's their major claim? Look, we're suffering because we've moved, we don't recognize God. God is not in a proper place in our society. So this isn't peculiar to the Middle East, but it's certainly acute in the Middle East, and it's one of the things that fuels the violent radical Islamic groups. Um, that's, and that's pretty visible. I mean, I think most Americans kind of see that. What's really not visible is there actually is an internal debate in the region that provides another answer to this question. If you watch Al Jazeera in Arabic or if you can do any kind of reading, um, you'll see that this debate is very much alive in the region. And the, the other side of this argument is now that religion isn't our problem. I mean, religion is our heritage, we subscribe to that, we believe in it, um, but what our real issue is, is we've lost that sense of political tolerance that we've had in the past. And if you want, you know, a, a good author to read in English, Marwan Muashar is one. Um, he's actually a former Jordanian uh, foreign minister and prime minister, and he's at Brookings. So he wrote that book, you know, The Second Arab Awakening. I mean, again, I mean, I, I think we just need to listen to voices in the region, right? If power is diffusing, if the United States isn't going to be a decisive influence in the region, we've got to start um, listening better to what's going on in the region and to people in the region. And uh, I cite Rami Khoury, who writes in English at the Daily Star in Lebanon, um, as just one example. And here it is in 2011. So at the very beginning of the Arab uprisings, I mean, very astute observation. He goes, mislabeling this, the Arab Spring, is just a fundal misunderstanding of what's going on in the region. The terms we use as Arabs to describe what's going on are revolution, Thawra or Thawrat, uh, revolutions. They're uprisings, intifada, the same term that's used for the Palestinian uprisings against the Israelis in the occupied territories. On a more positive, you know, bent, it's, uh, it's the awakening. Um, it's a renaissance. It's a nahda. So, you know, it's important to, to listen to those conversations that Arab themselves uh, 
are having. And if you take a look at the slogans um, that were actually used during the Arab uprisings, uh, one is clearly, I mean, again, they were targeting not the United States, not foreign actors, they were targeting their own actors. And it's Shab Yurid Eskat Nizam. So the people want an ousting or the ouster of the regime, and Nizam, the, the authoritarian governments. In uh, Tahrir Square, they had this. It really comes, the alliteration is beautiful in Arabic, but it's kind of bread, freedom, social justice. And uh, in Egyptian Arabic in particular, Al Aish comes from a word that really means source of life. So, so it's Al Aish, it's Al Huriya. So you kind of get the, you know, you get the rhythm in Arabic. But this is, these are the basic demands from the people um, who are populating and, and motivating these uprisings throughout the region. So just closing out, here, here are my kind of initial thoughts on what all this means, right? I mean, we're just, I think we're just at the beginning of this revolution in the region. Um, so this is going to be something that just plays out over decades. It's not going to be done in a year. It's not going to be done in two years. It's really going to be um, decades or a generation or two down the road before we kind of real, really see, you know, what these revolutions meant or didn't mean. And there's a debate in the academic community, you know, on the score. I mean, you have some folks who, and I'd say most folks who kind of study the course of revolutions in general, say, yeah, we're at the, we're at the very beginning. Uh, we don't know. The, you know, there's ups and downs. You make a step forward, you take two steps back. There's reaction, there's counter-reaction, so let's just see. You have other folks like Steve Cook at the Council on Foreign Relations who really thinks, no, you know what, the counter-revolutionaries have essentially squashed what was a revolution. Um, they haven't successfully replaced any government yet in the region, so this is just something that's really kind of, it was a flash in the pan, so to speak. So, I mean, we'll see how that turns out. But I think it is worth recognizing that um, if you take a look at kind of, these are all the ISIS provinces right throughout the region. And um, if you take a look at a map, you kind of get a real depressing sense of being overwhelmed in the fact that these radical Islamists are, are actually just rampaging through the region. But I think it's actually important to recognize that even these alliances are really just temporary alliances with ISIS. What they did was they really tapped into existing very small, um, but in some cases potent groups that have very local agendas. And uh, Hassan Hassan just wrote The Atlantic today, actually writes that a lot of these Sunni uh, jihadi groups, Al-Qaeda, um, ISIS inspired, are actually the trend going forward is for them to be more and more localized in abandoning kind of the global jihadi movement. Um, so, so I think that's a trend for the future. It's worth keeping in mind. Um, I do think US influence is kind of waning. Um, you can overplay our disengagement, because uh, if you take a look at you know, our pure military level of engagement, we're still you know, committed in Iraq pretty heavily, certainly in Afghanistan pretty heavily. Um, President Trump has announced a withdrawal from Syria, but we haven't really seen, seen it yet. And he's got his own advisors pushing hard against it. So we'll see how that plays out. But I think if you, know, if you take a look at the scale and the socioeconomic problems I talked about, US military is not the tool you want to pull out of your kit bag for that. If that's what's driving this instability, US military isn't going to fix that. Um, so we need to start looking elsewhere. And, and that's where I think kind of the big risk in strategy is Steve Metz is a colleague at uh, the Strategic Studies Institute in World Politics today. He actually writes a piece that gets to this. And he goes, you know, and we kind of talk about strategy in terms of uh, achieving the right balance between your ends or your objectives, your application of the instruments of power, and the resources you use to back those. And uh, Steve highlights the fact that, look, American culture is not to go small, we go big. So we have far-reaching objectives. Good enough is not okay in terms of US strategic objective, particularly when it comes to the application of military power. So whereas where we started in Afghanistan, the really narrow, small-scale mission was we're gonna oust the Taliban from power in Kabul, and we're gonna drive a wedge and make sure that they can't play host to Al-Qaeda in the future. 
Well, in really fairly rapid order, we accomplished that. But then the mission, you kind of get mission creep, and uh, folks are talking about, no, what we really need is a national government in Kabul that really is representative of the entire country, um, you know, protects women's rights, uh, ensures kids go to school, so the, so the objectives keep getting further and further out. Well, if you don't adjust your instruments of power, if you don't adjust where you're pushing resources, that's where you get strategic risk and failure. Um, so that's the bit on kind of the global um, and regional environment and dynamics. Um, all good strategy starts with an assessment of what U.S. national interests are. And I think those have been though, set here on the left are kind of what have guided U.S. policy in the Middle East for decades. And that's been pretty consistent. And you can see on the right is President Obama's list of what he called core U.S. national security interests. And you see they really reflect those five on the left, but in a different order. Right? This is a post-9-11 environment, so he bumps terrorism from the bottom to the top. But if you read through that, you kind of see, look, we've had a lot of consistency in terms of what U.S. national interests are in the region. In terms of President Trump, he released his national security strategy in 2017, a new national defense strategy in 2018, and um, he's really zeroed down U.S. objectives and interest in the region. And he focuses really on two, terrorism and pushing back against the expansion of Iranian influence. So those are the two objectives and national interests that are driving his strategy. So we've always had this tension in terms of long-term, vice short-term, you know, how you accomplish your short-term objectives, how you accomplish your long-term objectives. I would argue that the interests like energy, terrorism, non-proliferation, if you're going to accomplish those objectives, you need to be working with existing partners and, and governments in the region. And those governments default, by default are authoritarian governments. We didn't make it that way, but that's the region as it is. So if you want to advance those objectives, you need to build strong relationships and cooperate with those authoritarian governments. That said, our long-term objective, I think, is actually helping these countries transition from that authoritarian-style government to something that's more representative. It won't be exactly Western-style democracy. It'll have to be done within local culture, traditions, and norms. Um, but we want to help them with those economic, political transitions. And that's the long-term. And those two have kind of been in tension with one another. And we've had this huge gap intention between promoting U.S. values, liberalism, political freedom, uh, economic liberalization, um, just loosening, you know, government control of the economies, and pursuing those other interests that we talked about. And it's just in the wake of the Arab uprisings, that tension's become much, much more obvious and difficult to reconcile. So very briefly, I mean, kind of how do I see our interests changing? I mean, I think what initially has driven U.S. policy for decades has been that deal. We'll provide security, stability to the region in exchange for the free flow of oil, not only to the United States, but globally. Well, really, the shale revolution has kind of upended that, right? The U.S. is now, now outpaces oil production of Saudi Arabia and Russia. Um, a lot of analysts are now predicting that we'll be effectively energy independent as early as 2020. I mean, that's really around the, uh, around the corner. We'll only need, for our own internal reasons, to import oil from Canada. Other than that, we'll be self-sufficient. So that, again, that's kind of the, the pressure, the tectonic plates moving that are driving the U.S. You know, away from the, the Middle East. A regional stability, I mean, we built our military, right, was classically employed in Desert Shield, Desert Storm. We built it to fight strong state powers from gaining control of the region, whether it was from external powers like Russia um, invading Afghanistan in 1979 and building a U.S. military capacity to make sure 
you know, that didn't go further south, give them access to warm water parts on the Gulf and control of those valuable energy resources. But that's not the threat that we face today, right? There aren't strong state actors in the region. The threat today is the instability and chaos and discord that exists in the region. So, so we ought to be retooling our military to deal with that. And to a certain extent, you know, we certainly have, right? That's been our focus on counterinsurgency uh, missions in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere. Uh, proliferation has kind of gone up and down. I mean, I think as a whole, uh, the success of particularly uh, non-proliferation negotiations and diplomacy has really been rather good. Um, President Kennedy in the debates in the early 1960s said, you know, I expect by the end of my first presidential term that there will be between 10 and 20 nuclear powers in the world. And here we are, do the math, 50, 60, I'm terrible at math, um, but do the math 50 years later, and we've got nine nuclear powers. So, I mean, on the whole, I mean, nonproliferation negotiations, the uh, regimes that have been imposed have been effective. They haven't been perfect, but they've been fairly effective. And we had a fairly successful, what I would argue is successful nuclear agreement with Iran. And of course, President Trump, you know, has upended that. So now we're in a, a period of uncertainty we can talk about um, later. Uh, also defending Israel. I mean, really, it's worth remembering that the U.S. relationship with Israel, too, has gone up and down. I mean, President Truman recognized Israel in 1948 over the objections of his foreign policy advisors, like Marshall, who said U.S. interests are not with this tiny minority state in Israel. U.S. interests are with the oil-producing Arab majority in the country, and, um, and President Truman, you know, override that. And it was really only until the, after the 1973 war that U.S. investment in the region and support for Israel really picked up pace. Um, and really, we've given them since then roughly about $130 billion in U.S. economic and military assistance to the extent that right now, I mean, they're recognized as the military power in the region, right? So the question is, A, does Israel really need us anymore? And B, you know, how important is U.S. support to Israel nowadays? And, and that's a conversation that's happening both ways. Um, the issue of terrorism similarly has gone up and down. I mean, for decades, we treated it as just a manageable threat. Uh, President Clinton's national security strategy, even after the bombings in Africa in 1998, still said, yeah, terrorism is a problem, but really it's a manageable problem that ought to be addressed, not with military means, but through diplomacy, economic, and financial incentives. So, and of course, 9-11 changed all that. Uh, the question is, you know, are we reverting back and trying to de-emphasize the war on terrorism. If you take a look at President Trump's national security strategy of 2017, that's exactly what it does. I mean, it says we're, we're no longer going to emphasize terrorism. We're going to focus on great power competition now with uh, Russia and Europe and with China and Asia. So we'll see how that goes. But disengagement um, is tough. So overall, I mean, what do I think all this means? I think if you add all this together, uh, this really means that, that um, a massive dominating U.S. conventional military presence in the region is probably not what we need going forward. I mean, really what we, what we need in the region is those smaller, specialized, um, in particular special operations forces to kind of handle the... Um, the building partner capacity with countries and the, their militaries in the region. We've given them expertise in the counterterrorism fight. And we also kind of re need to rebalance um, a policy, a foreign policy that I think post 9-11 has really become over-militarized. Right? We've really put a big emphasis on the M and dime, diplomacy, information, military, economics. And we've got to retool what we need to do is retool that, to re-emphasize diplomacy, information, and economics, address those social economic problems that are really the fundamental cause of instability in the region, and kind of de-emphasize our, our military engagement in the region. I don't think that's going to happen, um, but I think it's what 
should happen. Maybe in Q&A we can talk about why I don't think that's going to happen. But it kind of leaves us with two alternatives, right? If you don't like where we are now, a kind of a classic realist like Steve Walt at Harvard will say we need to resume an offshore balancing strategy, which is essentially just pull the majority of the U.S. military out of the region, and you only re-engage when your vital interests are at stake and when you need to kind of restore balance to the region. Uh, the other alternative is, I think, where uh, the Trump administration is at, which is what we're going to do is we're going to foster and recreate that traditional balance of power. We're going to back the Sunni Arab states against Iran, and that will effectively restore a balance in the region. And there are pros and cons to both um, approaches, but those, I think, are the two major alternatives to where we are today. Um, I've got a little bit of time, so I'll quickly go through kind of those um, issues and again maybe lay a foundation for your questions and our discussion afterwards. Um, in terms of what's required, in terms of the anti-terrorism, the anti-ISIS fight, I mean I think it's worth keeping Churchill's adage in mind. You know, however beautiful the strategy in writing, occasionally you ought to do a serious assessment of what the results are. And I think it, it's a mixed result in terms of the war on terrorism, right? I mean, it's on the plus side, we've not had another 9-11. I mean, that's 17, 18 years hence. And that's not a small accomplishment, right? That's something um, that we ought to recognize is on the positive side of the ledger. Now, on the negative side of the ledger, I think you need to take a look at, okay, well, in the immediate aftermath of the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan, um, Al-Qaeda was reduced to a couple of a couple hundred Al-Qaeda fighters in, uh, in the mountains of the tribal areas of Pakistan and Afghanistan. And right now you've got ISIS alone estimated at having between 20 and 30,000 fighters in Syria, in Iraq alone. So you've got more groups, more fighters. They're coming not only from the region, but they're coming from Europe and uh, in marginalized communities there. So that I think you have to fairly put you know, on the negative side of the ledger that, that causes us to rethink where we're going. Um, the toughest thing to do I think is really kind of decide what is a rational, realistic, achievable objective for the war on terrorism. If it's the eradication of terrorism, good luck. Because, um, I mean, that's just part of human history, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Um, the kind of verbiage we use now is the enduring defeat. But what is that? I mean, what does that mean? I mean, we're how far out of the Second World War, and we're still fighting and battling neo-Nazi ideology, right? And that's after we, I mean, we crushed Germany and essentially let it, let it, left it devastated and we, we're still struggling with that today decades later. So, you know, how realistic is that? Um, is degrade, on the other hand, is degrade enough? I mean, again, going to Steve Metz's article, try and make this argument to the public. But look, we're, we're really not going to beat these guys. We're just going to have to live with a terrorist threat and people are going to die, but that's good enough for now. I mean, that, that's a tough sell, right? So, so that's a debate, I think, that needs to be had. And, and I think also keeping in mind uh, Lawrence of Arabia's adage, too. I mean, I, again, I, I think the major cause of instability in the region is internal. It's those socioeconomic political problems. Those are all issues Arabs themselves have to figure out how they're going to solve. And what trade-offs are they willing to make? To, to have that pluralistic, tolerant, stable, um, economically prosperous society. We can't make it for them. They're going to have to make that decision. But that means kind of we got to take our hands off the gas pedal and, and steering wheel a little bit, which, which doesn't sit well with, with a lot of Americans or American leaders. Um, so this kind of is pretty consistent with the rest of my talk. I mean, I think if you buy off on this, where we really need to emphasize is kind of we really need to support the non-military instruments of power. Uh, we need better diplomacy. We need to do it with not only the governments in the region, but we need to do it with the people of the region, which is really tough to do, because guess what? The authoritarian governments in the region, 
don't want us dealing with the people. I mean, they're passing all kinds of legislation, you know, to minimize the ability of non-governmental organizations to work, um, the ability of even what were very neutral um, organizations like both uh, Democratic and Republican, you know, uh, committees and organizations promoting local activism and democracy in the region. They're pushing back against that hard. So that's not going to be an easy sell, but I think it's what we need to do. And the humanitarian relief aspect, I mean, the challenges of this are just daunting. Uh, this is a before and after picture of Aleppo, before the Civil War and after. And if this lecture isn't depressing enough for you, just Google before and after Syrian Civil War. And just you get a sense for the devastation in Syria alone. But in Syria alone, it's probably over a trillion dollars worth of rebuilding assistance that's going to be required. And now you think about it, you've had school-age children have been out of school now for close to a decade. They're not going to have competitive education or skills to compete in an economy going forward. So all those socioeconomic problems are just exacerbated even more. And you're talking about a tremendous international effort that's going to be required to rebuild these war-torn countries in the region. And I don't see anyone who has the appetite for handling it. Right? I mean, Russia's under sanctions. They're an oil-dependent economy. Oil prices are kind of projected to be flat for the future going forward. Um, Iran is another big partner, particularly in Syria. Um, they're under U.S. sanctions. They're struggling with oil prices. Uh, so, you know, who in this kind of environment is going to be willing to pony up those costs? Um, unfortunately, it's easy to point out the problems, right? Um, unfortunately, I think if you, you know, if you go, well, it's just too hard to do, well, then you've got to admit that we're kind of looking at perpetual war conflict coming from this region, and that's the alternative. So if you don't like the increased diplomacy, uh, the increased investment in these societies, uh, you're just going to have to accept perpetual conflict and struggle. Let me see, we jumped here ahead a little bit. Let me see. Um, let me talk a little bit about Iran. Um, Iran's not going anywhere. It's been in the region, it's been a powerful force in the region for a long, long time. I mean, Robin Wright, his uh, journalist and scholar, uh, she writes at the U.S. Institute for Peace. She's a journalist with the New York Times. She's been in and out of Iran um, for decades, ever since before the revolution in 79. And when she lectures American audiences, she says, if you want to understand Iranian nationalism and their sense of pride and place in the world, you know how Texans feel about Texas? Multiply that by 20, and that's what you have with Iranian nationalism. And they've got the population. Uh, it's three times the population of Iraq. It's physically twice the size of Texas, has multiple mountain ranges, vast deserts. And so if you loved the U.S. invasion and occupation of Iraq, you're going to love what comes next in Iran. I mean, Iraq will be a cakewalk compared to what Iran would be. Um, so that's, that's all worth considering. Um, the Iranians, of course, have a little bit different perspective, right? Particularly this administration now is really sees Iran as the major source of problems and instability in the region. And there's, there's not, you know, that's not wrong, right? I mean, they certainly seek to exacerbate that. Um, but Iranians, as you might guess, have quite a different perspective, right? They're a minority in a Sunni region. As I said, they're about 10% of the population in the Middle East are Shia. Um, they're Persian by in terms of history and ethnicity and language and tradition and culture, um, as opposed to the vast majority of the region that's Arab. They take a look at the region and, you know, we complain, yeah, you know what? Iran's in Syria, they're in Lebanon, they're in, um, uh, where else? Syria, Yemen, Yemen uh, Lebanon, and, and they go, well, okay, but guess what? The U.S. is everywhere in the region. So they, they have a sense of being in very much a defensive posture 
Um, and you know, again, in fairness, they haven't they haven't invaded any other countries in modern time. And they look at take a look at their support for terrorist groups like Hezbollah, like Hamas, and they say, look, this is this is asymmetry in motion, right? So, and as McMaster said when he was National Security Advisor, he said there are two ways ways to fight the United States: asymmetrically and stupid. And Iranians are not stupid. So they're going to pursue their national interests through these asymmetric means short of conventional war. Um, this is kind of the strategic landscape when you talk about Iran. And this is a survey that was done pretty recently here. And you see that, that as you might guess, I mean, the Iranian public largely supports Iranian nuclear activity, particularly on the civilian front. Well over 80% of the population believe that's their right. We're entitled to enrich uranium. Um, the vast energy resources we do have, and they're the number one in terms of natural gas reserves, two or three in terms of oil reserves, because that's a primary source of export for us, we need to keep that in the ground and preserve it for export. And we need alternative energies for domestic consumption. Right? I mean, that's a fair argument to make, and you're seeing it made by Saudi Arabia and others in the region now, too, that are in a similar boat. They're like, oh, we've got limited oil, um, and we need to preserve it, keep it in the ground, and save it for export, so we need alternative means of energy. And you can see that the vast majority you know, also think it's for uh, peaceful purposes as well. Um, you can take a look, and this is the hill that the U.S. has to climb in terms of Iranian attitudes. They go, what do you, in terms of unfavorable views, and U.S., and the U.S. government in particular, tops the list. One of the ironic aspects of the Iranian public is they're one of the most pro-American people in the region in terms of their view of American values, traditions, democracy, liberalization. The Iranians actually support all that, despite decades of san sanctions, et cetera, and an otherwise troubled history. They're still relatively pro-American. They're just anti-American foreign policy in the region. Um, and then this last uh, bit, let me see. Uh, so who do you blame here? This is the other interesting thing when you start talking about the purpose of American sanctions is, I mean, the Iranians are very sophisticated folks. They're a very sophisticated population. On the whole, they're very well educated. And so they know that, look, most of the economic problems we're facing are due to our own leadership, the corruption and the mismanagement of our economy. So they place a huge degree of blame for their economic troubles on the Iranian leadership itself. Um, and, and that's been a cause of some protests in, in Iran itself. So, you know, that's kind of a, a couple positive things going. Of course, the big issue is the nuclear deal, uh, the JCPOA, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Um, here's the case for, I mean, these are not insignificant achievements of what President Obama um, and Europe, uh, the P5 from the UN Security Council achieved. I mean, about a 98% percent reduction in terms of the enriched uranium on hand, reduce the centrifuges that are spinning um, and creating this enriched uranium by two-thirds. And they, it actually imposed what was the most robust and intrusive international inspections regime in history, so known as the additional protocols. So these, again, are positive things. Like a lot of things in foreign policy, you know, they're all tough calls, though, right? You don't get everything. And here's the case against, right? And it's mostly that the case against is that, look, a lot of these provisions um, that we've got in the nuclear deal, the restrictions on Iranian activities in terms of developing their civil nuclear program, a lot of those expire in 10, 15, 20 years. So at the end of that period, Iran's going to be in a much better position to actually move to weaponization if that's the way they want to go. And it's worth recalling that US intelligence community doesn't see that happen. 
and neither does the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency. But that's the argument against, was it was a bad, fundamentally flawed deal. And oh, by the way, it doesn't deal with other problematic activities that Iran has undertaken in the region, like terrorism, like their development of ballistic missiles. So we just had to trash the deal and we need to start from scratch. Um, Secretary Pompeo, kind of in his speech, announcing a new Iran strategy, listed these 12 conditions that most foreign policy analysts and kind of the elite or the blob, if you will, really take a look at there's no hope that Iran is going to comply with all 12 of these demands. It essentially amounts to an unconditional surrender and an agreement to stop pursuing their interest outside of Iran. So folks will say, well, that's, that's just not in the cards. And we can go over these a little bit in more detail in Q&A, but I want to push forward. So for the other part, you know, on the, if you're a believer in diplomatic ambiguity, um, you'll love his speech because he has elements that'll, you know, satisfy everybody. If you're a supporter of engagement, there's, there are phrases in there that would lead you to believe, okay, uh, at least the Trump administration is open to a deal, a new deal, a better deal, a grand bargain, if you will, that'll address the shortfalls of the nuclear deal as we've had it. You can also take a look at, well, maybe if you're a supporter, or look, we need to push back against Iranian influence. There's language you can see there that you might like. And if you're, uh, we need to go all out regime change, the problem is not only their behavior, and certainly their behavior will never change unless we get a new regime in Tehran. If you're of that school, he, there's some red meat there for you too. So um, on the negative side of that ledger, that means it's really tough for folks to understand where U.S. policy is. It's like you've got elements of all the above. Um, so, so folks are just wondering, where are we going to go? Um, and that's only been exacerbated by um, other speeches, um, Pompeo's in Cairo, and then um, National Security Advisor Bolton did a video just a couple days ago on the 40th anniversary of the Iranian Revolution. And you take a quick look at that language and it's, you know, most folks would say he's been an open supporter of regime change in the past. He's saying you're not going to have too many more anniversaries to look forward to, which is pretty implicit regime change argument. So that's where most folks kind of think the administration is. Um, and again, it's kind of tough to predict how this is going to come out. Predicting the course of revolutions is really, really hard to do. Folks were shocked by the 1979 Iranian Revolution will likely be shocked at the next one if it comes down the road and you've got indications um, both ways, although as Suzanne Maloney uh, points out here, you know, you're, you're, the consensus is the Iranian regime is probably going to withstand this additional economic pressure. One, they've done it before. Two, there are a lot of folks in Europe, in Asia, who are pushing back and trying to resist. Uh, the reimposition of U.S. sanctions. So these sanctions are going to leak and it's really not going to be a unified effort. Um, so the kind of the elite consensus is, yeah, probably not much going to happen. But as uh, Suzanne points out here, that's right until the day it's not. So, so again, humility uh, is not a bad thing here. Um, I have a little bit more nuanced assessment of the Iranian threat. I mean, I think it's worthwhile keeping in mind that Iranian interests do not overlap with U.S. interests. I mean, their primary interest is to drive the United States out of the region to increase their freedom of maneuver in the region. So that's clear. I mean, there's like zero overlap in terms of U.S. and Iranian interests. But I think it's also worth remembering that while the Iranians take advantage of the discord in the region, they're not the proximate cause for it. They didn't start the Arab uprisings anywhere in the region. They didn't start the civil war in Yemen. They didn't cause Saudi Arabia to uh, decide to blockade Qatar and create this phenomenal internal split with the GCC that provides Iran an opening. Um, they're a Sunni or a Shia country who is apparently opposed to these Sunni Shia terrorist groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, and they've been partners in terms of the fight against ISIS in Iraq 
and elsewhere. And as I kind of alluded to at the beginning, Iran's not going anywhere. And so they're going to be needed if you want a resolution in Syria, if you want a resolution in Afghanistan, if you want a resolution in Yemen, you're going to have to engage Iran. Uh, Syria, and we'll, I'll maybe wrap it up here and we'll just go to Q&A. Um, just a quick kind of recap of where we're at. Um, Assad is in this red area here. So he's kind of effectively reimposed his control over about two-thirds of Syria. You have this one Idlib pocket here where about 20 to 30,000 of the uh, Sunni fundamentalist terror groups are kind of crammed in that area as Assad has reestablished his control um, in the other areas. They've kind of provided um, exit for all the bad actors out of those areas and they're now concentrated in Idlib. So that's the, the big next major battle um, that's probably taking place. And of course you have the U.S. and eastern, northeastern Syria here, um, although the, the days of our presence there are, are probably numbered if, uh, if the president gets his way. Uh, the big problems I see with U.S.-Syria strategy, as I've already kind of alluded to, is, is we've not decide, decided what it is we want to accomplish. I mean, the whole logic and legal justification for our foreign military presence in Syria has been the defeat of ISIS. Well, the, def the military defeat of ISIS is at hand, right? I mean, just this past week, they were down to two villages in Syria and the U.S. Uh, supported Kurdish forces have been pushing those ISIS remnants out of there. So that doesn't mean they're eliminated, right? They're, they're not, they've not gone away, but essentially what was the physical caliphate in both Iraq and Syria has now been taken apart. And that's not an insignificant victory for U.S. military forces. The question is, of course, what comes after? And you've had uh, Bolton and others kind of saying, well, it's not. The president has said, we're done with the mission. We accomplished the mission. We're out of there. His seniors advisors have kind of offered additional rationale for a continued U.S. military presence, whether it's ousting Iran, protecting the Kurds, um, or whatever. So um, we'll see how that debate plays out. And I mean, I'll say, and we'll leave this for Q&A maybe, um, kind of how I view the U.S. withdrawal or the decision to withdraw from Syria is I think arguably it was the right decision. We never really have had vital interest engaged in Syria. Russia and Iran have been engaged with Syria and close partners to the Assad family in Syria for decades. It is a vital interest for them. It's not really for us, but the decision was made in the worst possible way. I mean, zero consultation with his own national security advisors. You saw General Votel recently said, yeah, I, who's commander of CENTCOM? Yeah, I wasn't consulted. Nobody talked to me about it. And apparently we had very little to no consultation with our allies. And there are British and French troops on the ground who are helping us. Puts them in a precarious spot. Of course, the relationship with the Kurds is up for grabs right now, too. So... Even if it was the right decision, it was probably made in the worst possible way. So we're up on an hour now, so how long do you want to take a break?